and that's all of my announcements. I think you know Sam Sator and his wife Dog and Master Gardeners on Oak Street. That everybody's envious of that garden. So anyway, they're going to impart some of their wisdom with us today. So thank you so much. I don't know if I call it wisdom so much, um, but before we start. John has a couple of announcements that will pertain to all gardeners. Yeah. Hi, I'm John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Wow. Sounds like a neat name. A couple of announcements. <laughs> this coming Saturday, right, right here, uh, is the organizational meeting for the farmers market. We'll be discussing dates and times and rules and all that stuff. So, if you're interested in being a vendor or just curious. It's from 11 to 1. And then the next day, Sunday, at the Walsenberg Library, from 1 to 3 is a seed exchange. It's free. You don't necessarily have to bring seeds. There will be lots of uh, vegetables, flowers, and herb seeds to go around. Thank you. Oh, not good. <laughs> oh, technology. Yeah, technology, isn't it? Good? <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And I promise I'll put on my, my teacher voice. Um, I did, uh, well, I used to teach middle school <laughs> band. <laughs> okay, so at one point I had 77th graders with noisemakers in their hands. Oh, wow. So I'm used to being able to talk loud. And Di has no other voice but to talk loud. <laughs> so I'll throw her under the bus too. Okay, um, I hope today can be a, a lot of exchange of information, not just from us to you, but from you to each other and you guys to us and uh, just, just make it an, an open, free, whatever. Um, we're going to go through a lot of things that we've done in the last 10 years. Some of them have worked, some of them have not worked. And we're going to share our, our experiences here. The biggest challenge here, of course, is the altitude. And along with the altitude comes a lot of things, like wind and, um, well, just because of where we are, too, uh, critters like deer. Um, and we have, in the last three months, right, we've had our first rabbit. <laughs> and um, what's really bad is there's only one, and you're going, yeah, like there could only be one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, we're we're going to talk about some of the things we've used to uh, deter critters and take care of wind and take care of drought and altitude and and the the extreme UV rays that we get at this altitude and and that kind of thing. So. Um, I'm going to start with our 10-year journey and the things that we did over 10 years and then we'll get into kind of a, a, a class kind of setting where we share um, different things that you can do because we can believe, we believe that everybody in this room can do gardening to whatever extent you want to do it. Now as you drive by our house on Oak Street, it's on the corner of Virginia and Oak, it's a great big garden that's right there. Most people know it. But we certainly don't expect people coming in for the first time to start a garden that big. I grew up around gardening. I grew up around gardening, so we've always had that. I've, I've gardened since I was oh, a teenager and loved it. And so um, it, it came easy to us. Well, not so much easy, but we knew what we were getting into. Let's put it that way. So, um, but anyone in here can do it at whatever scale they want to do it. And you can do it from a simple pot on a deck all the way up through something great big like we've got. So um, It's also a matter of remembering that a seed only has one purpose, and that's to grow, in spite of you. Um, so, so just saying that knowing the potential in a seed, and I'm looking around the room here, and you all are seeds of gardeners. No matter what level you're at, you can do gardening. Oh, we're learning. We're still learning. Every day we learn something. So, next one. I found this great quote. The glory of gardening, hands in the dirt, head in the sun, heart with nature. 
To nurture a garden is to feed not just on the body, but the soul. Share the botanical bliss of gardeners through the ages who have cultivated philosophies and applied to their own and our own lives. Show me your garden, and I shall tell you what you are. Alfred Austin. It's kind of a nice little quote. And uh, like, uh, like, like Mitzi said, this will be taped and put somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the ethos. Yeah, somewhere out there, in, yeah. Yeah, out there in the yeah. ether somewhere. So, Okay, this is where we started. When we moved down here, it was about a dozen years ago, um, and we had been coming down, oh, seven or eight before that, and living in an RV, and then we bought a place, our place there, and we bought it specifically knowing we wanted to garden. And so we had a couple of goals. First goal was self-sufficiency. And I don't mean self-sufficiency in the prepper kind of way. I mean self-sufficiency in the way of being able to control what we grew and how it was grown. And there's nothing more disappointing than a store tomato. It tastes like disappointment. So we thought, no, we're going to do, we're going to do our own. So we wanted to control our own food supply. We wanted to be self-sufficient. And we wanted to help others uh, achieve a degree of self-sufficiency brings up a very important point. If you're driving by Oak Street and you see us out, you're more than welcome to stop by. Okay, we'll answer questions, we'll take you on a little tour and sit down and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever, you know, and just <laughs> friendly up. Um, that's what we do, we share what we've done in hopes that you can gain from our experience and our mistakes. Okay, we started our village homestead. We always wanted to call it a village homestead. It was a cool term. So oh, wow. this is what we started with. Welcome wow. to our graves. <laughs> For the longest time, people thought that maybe it was because the cemetery was crowded and that they needed more. And we had a lot of people stopping and saying, um, are your relatives out here? And I said, like, no. Oh, especially over the first snow. The first snow covered that. It, was, it did. It looked like graves sitting there. It was kind of spooky. And that was another shot of the backyard with nothing there. So one of the first things we did was we put in what we thought would, oh, that's going to be a nice herb bed. So we put it there under that tree. The position of that great big tree is on the west side of our growing beds. Perfect. Because it blocks the late afternoon hot sun. We put the herb bed deliberately underneath that because we wanted the shade because it helps parsley not bolt. <laughs> Little things like that. So um, uh, that, that's what we did. We put in the first herb bed. <coughs> then, I don't know if anyone in here, does anyone in here remember the people that were in our house before us? A few of you do. Put your hands down. Emily, Emily Bell. Bell. Oh, yeah. Okay, Emily was in that house, and Emily's, Emily's husband, Tom, had the great big garden. And she had, right in this area here, an asparagus bed. And so the asparagus bed has got to be 30 years old. Wow. And it's still producing. We added a few yeah. crowns to that, but we wanted to cordon it off and uh, so we could uh, kind of maintain the soil at a decent level and um, do things like that. So that was one of the, so that's the second thing we put in. Um, there was also a lot of really, really pretty poppies. We kept those. Then we thought, well, ultimately we're gonna have to feed those piles of dirt out there. Now, where we are also used to be part of the river. Year, I mean, way 30s. 20s, back in, way back in the day. The, the river didn't go where it goes now. The, rock, the rocked bank of the river came as a work project, uh, project in the 20s, 30s, and the 30s. And so they moved the river. So it kind of came up, and occasionally it would flood. And so we have some pretty decent bottom land there. So the soil's not too bad. Still a lot of clay, just like everyone else. It's either clay or sand. And anyway, so we needed a way to do it, so I started building some compost bins. So that was the next thing. No, go back one. Really? Yeah, uh, really. Um, rocked in the perennials. They love heat. And it also, rock is a great mulch. It 
maintains water. So we rocked that in. That was the next step. You also see back up in here a split rail fence. We had the hurricane fence, the chain link fence all the way around it. And 12 years ago, 11, 10 years ago, the deer weren't much of a problem in La Vida. And ask the people who've been around a long time. There weren't a lot of deer problems in La Vida at the time. And so the deer that were here, the double fence, six feet apart, <coughs> deer don't have peripheral vision, so it confused them. So they wouldn't jump into the yard. Did a great job for several years. Okay, now you can go on. Okay, that was our first garden, the start of our first garden. Nothing real formal, just spots in the dirt, and we plugged things in. We had a lot of work to do. Then, this is probably, oh, two months later, um, mulch some of the pathways. You can see they're still full of weeds. And then we had, our garden was growing pretty good. And, um, you know, we got a lot of bounty off of it that year, a lot of salad and stuff that year. Here's another shot of it. <clears throat> um, got a lot of squash and lots of beans and tomatoes and everything you'd want. A lot of broccoli. We're kind of going through this quick. Hold, go back. We'll talk about this in a minute, but there is a purpose for that great big center path. And I'll share that with you after a while when we get to a special picture. Uh, lavender grows really well here. Um, we've discovered that what is exposed to the deer, deer don't generally like things that are purple. So cat mint, salvia, lavender, they don't touch those, which is great. So that's what we grew. Have to kind of work with what you've got, okay? That was that herb bed um, and a lot of the, the growth there. Um, rhubarb and we had, and this is still growing, uh, that um, oregano there. Um, oregano, it's like you can't kill it once you get it in there. And the deer won't eat that either. And parsley, and we've got um, tarragon in there, and some culinary sage, and chives, and there's room for lots of stuff. So that's what we put in there the first year. The poppies kept growing and growing, and you can see we also have the um, Russian sage and the, um, anything else in there? I don't see anything else. Some cat mint. Yeah. Okay. Next one. So... That was pretty much the end of our first year. You'll notice, we got tired of just having dirt and mud and stuff like that. So we went up in the hills and got a, a, a gather permit and started gathering these big aspen logs. And we outlined our beds with logs. We didn't have a whole lot of money. I mean, so we, it took a long time to make this happen. So that was the, the first step was outlining with the, the logs and we would amend the soil every year with a bag or two of compost and that was great. And now you can see that dye is busy because we splurged and thought these logs are starting to rot and fall apart. And it took two or three years for them to do that. It looks like we killed Alice. Yeah, the dog. We did not kill Alice. That's our grand dog. That's our grand dog. <laughs> anyway, and then we started putting two by sixes around to box them in and, and hold the soil in. And by the time we got done, it looked like that the following year. We still have the double fences. We still have, um, uh, I think we had gotten rid of all of the aspen log boundaries. So it's all boxed in right now, okay? All right, this is a picture, uh, and we'll get into the, the how we did this too. We decided to add chickens. So we have uh, chickens now that help us build the beds and fertilize the beds. And that little structure that's over the top of them is a, uh, is what's what called a, ch a chicken tractor. It's got two wheels on one end and like um, wheelbarrow handles on the other end. And you just pick it up and wheel it around. And we build it to fit over the tops of the beds. So we put the chickens in there, put a top on them so they don't get overheated, a little water, and leave them there for the day. We have owls and hawks. So we always box them in so that they wouldn't get hurt. Okay. Our babies are protected. Yes. Okay, then we got the, the smart idea to get bees. Well, no, there's a story behind this. 
before we move on here, we have two boys. Actually, they're men. grown men now. Manly um, men. Quite, quite grown. <laughs> Back in the day, when we still lived up in Castle Rock, the boys decided I needed something to do. <laughs> I wasn't keeping him busy enough. <laughs> so they got me a beehive kit. So they put it together, started learning about bees, and then we knew we were going to move down here. So we put it off and just held the stuff. <clears throat> that was my first hive of bees 10 years ago, um, 9 years ago. And you can see the bees are all being healthy right here, and they're starting to beard there. And um, it's. Bees are fascinating. Anyway, if anyone wants to know more about bees, we'll tell you about the bees. Um, um, that's, a whole, that's a whole lecture in, in itself. So um, that was our first harvest of honey. Uh, pretty light that year, but it's delicious. Anyway, and then I thanked the, the bee girls by building them their own yard. <laughs> Had to have somewhere nice for them to go. Okay. And... Um, honey keeps the bears out. A 7,000 volt electric fence. <laughs> and I'll talk about that in a minute. We have a picture where it didn't work. <laughs> okay. Where the bear got curly hair. Yeah. Back, backing, backing up in time a little bit, we decided we needed to extend the season. So we really like greens. And so I built these cold frames. The Methodist church at the time was getting rid of old storm windows. So we took the old storm windows and um, built, oh, I don't know, three or four of these uh, cold frames. And that was the, um, there's spinach and there's chard and I think there's a couple of carrots in there yeah. and some lettuce. Um, anyway, that, that was our first harvest out of the, our first year growing out of the cold frames. So in the winter time, when we had stuff on the ground, the cold frames were great. Also had a couple more big windows. So I put it over one of the garden beds. It worked great until the wind blew. <laughs> Here, when the wind blows, that's, that is nothing but um, a little frame of a window, a big storm window, a couple of frames fastened together at the top with the plastic over the top. It worked fine. Grab Molly. Not this kind. I will, no. yeah. This is a great thing. And I'd be more than happy to have people come by and look at plans and, and build their own. This is um, an A-frame, and it is made out of what's called twin wall poly, which is this stuff. And um, we also use this for the roof of our greenhouse, and I'll get to that in a minute. But this poly running along there with a 2 by 4 frame, and then I discovered that you can get 2 by 3 uh, construction lumber cheaper and it's lighter and it's still heavy enough the wind won't blow this away and we have salad greens all winter long all winter because there's enough in there um, you have to establish it a little bit ahead of the first really hard hard freezes but it won't freeze under there and um, we, we get everything bok choy spinach um, lettuce all kinds of great things out of that so then we've got a wild hare and Thanks to Sandy, who's sitting there, yes. Heck bar. when we replaced all the windows in the library. Remember that? Yeah. We took all the windows. She said, I'm going to throw these away. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> took the storm windows home. And that's what we ended up with. Those are the windows out of the greenhouse, or in our greenhouse that, are, that came out of all the windows around here. So um, designed this, bought a door, then this twin wall poly is on the roof, and it's a great season extender. We don't use it to actually grow in the greenhouse. We don't grow in ground in the greenhouse. We use it for early seed starting and holding things late, and um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Anyway, so when it's full, it looks nice. Um. In the town of La Vida, you don't need a building permit for uh, a building under 120 square feet. Our greenhouse is 8 feet by 10 feet. <laughs> um, but, but we did have approval as far as they knew we were building it and what the dimensions were going to be. But um, uh, So we, we just came under 10 by 12 by doing yeah. it. 
You notice the grape without barrels? Those barrels, there's three 75 gallon water barrels and they're full of water and they hold the heat. Uh, that's our heat sink in there for uh, season extension. So the ambient temperature, even in the dead of winter, is about 15 degrees above the outside air. So when it gets down to 30, we're still at a good 42, 43 in the greenhouse. So in probably about the end of April, we'll start putting everything out in the greenhouse at that point. Okay. Okay, then we have decided to. Heat to uh, what? That? No. What now? You don't have supplemental heat to no. that? Nope. Do not have supplemental heat. We could put it in. Right. But I didn't want to. There's no reason to. Do you okay. start your seedlings then in in house? In the house, and we'll get to that in a bit. Okay. Okay. What the cluck? We're adding chickens. So, um, <clears throat> being a math teacher, um, I did teach high school math, and geometry was one of my things. So I thought we're going to make a green or a, a chicken coop. So I made this chicken coop, and I said. Can you make it look like a caboose? <laughs> I suppose. So there's our caboose. Um, anyway, that's that's what it looked like. Note it's elevated, and we keep hay bales around three sides of it, north, south, and west. We only keep it open to the east, and the chickens all weather come down the ramp and go underneath. It cools them in the summer, it warms them in the winter, they have a dry place to go, they can still take a dust bath. Um, but yeah, it's great, they love it. And so that's it, mostly finished, and then we put uh, a scratch yard around it. And so it's chicken wire from halfway up and all the way around the roof, all the way across the, the top. And then down below is, is um, quarter inch hardware cloth, and it's buried. Um, with the sharp edges down, and we have not had any problems with anybody digging underneath it or anything like that. So, and that's our first bunch of pullets. We uh, decided we did not want to raise chickens in the house. Uh, we have a dog and a cat and don't like the dust and the mess, and so we thought, nah, we're going to get them up a little bit. So these, uh, these girls are what, about five months old here? Mm, yes. Yeah. Anyway, so we got four pullets, and that's our first egg. Oh. <laughs> Proud parents of our first egg. <laughs> okay, um, the one thing I will say now is never, ever, ever cease to have fun gardening. Stop and enjoy it and love what you're doing and have fun doing it. So, you remember I said that there was a reason for that thing? Okay, we play the French game of pétanque. Um, so we have these little steel balls and, and things and a glass of wine out there and enjoy, enjoy a game of pétanque, okay. Um, whimsy is great. We decorate the chicken coop at Christmas time. They uh, deserve it. They, they deserve it. Eggs. We put lights and we put a, a wreath on their little gate and, you know, it just, you got to, you have to be silly too, you know, you have to do it. Okay, next one. Like you had a yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah, with you, no. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things we also did one year, it, it worked out perfectly. The apple trees back here were in bloom. This is our backyard. We'll show you more of that later. The apple trees were in bloom. The bees were out all over the apple trees. It was April, May, May, yeah, it was May. There was about two, three weeks of school left. The kindergarten class came over for a lesson on bees. <laughs> so they got their lesson on bees and we did their little age-appropriate literature, and we showed them all the pieces and parts, and, and then we closed down with um, biscuits and honey. And kids were uh, licking their plates. It was great. It was so much fun. And uh, that's Peggy over standing there. So she was helping at kindergarten at that, at that point. Um, we take silly pictures. Um, we have to do that. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> Me and my favorite cabbage. Next one. <laughs> yeah, so we have a glass of wine by one of the things out back. We'll show you more of that later. And a little welcome to the wine sign. So, okay. Um, the other thing we did is when we replaced a lot of the hurricane fence that we had, the chain link fence, 
There were gates and panels and stuff. Right now we have tall black wrought iron gates in the back, but we took those gates down and I said, let's do something with them. Okay, what do you want to do? Well, she painted them different bright colors and uses them as trellises in the garden. So uh, we, we try not to waste anything. That's our gated garden. That's our gated garden. That's right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> That's our granddaughter uh, picking up Easter ago. eggs. Um, long time ago. Long time ago. Um, around the cold frames. This is a smart thing. I mean, this is paid for itself, even though it was didn't Free. cost anything. Um, <laughs> we built an outdoor sink area to clean off the veg before you take it in the house. Mm -hmm. Just using the hose and a couple of buckets to catch the water, and then you throw the bucket somewhere where they need water. Um, it's been a great boom. It has really saved um, things. So, all right, a few of the challenges. Anybody recognize this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. He was a mean one. Um, I think he's the one that broke the, the cage. Uh, there were two years in a row we moved five of them each year. <laughs> and we moved them here and we took them over, way over by the uh, reservoir over there, uh, over by the by state park, Lathrop, yeah. and let them go over there. Um, they won't return over like 10 miles or so, so we've got them about 12 miles out. And um, <coughs> anyway, they're, they're mean. They're just horrible mean. So yeah, they were fun. Aww. That's the year the bear did get through the fence. And they were particularly hungry that year. I think that was the year after the fire. And so they were really, really hungry. And they were tearing up everything. Um, I will tell you that <clears throat> the state of Colorado Department of Wildlife considers bees livestock. And so you can get money back from them if you can show that you've taken precautions. Well, I had the remnants of my 7,000 volt electric fence. It pulses, by the way. Uh, it, not very high amperage, but the volts are high. Um, it's a solar thing. It's a solar thing. And I had uh, what are called uh, bear boards. What they are is you take plywood about the size of this table here and drill three inch screws up through it. Several of those around. And that will usually uh, discourage raccoons and bears and, and things like that. Uh, they're called non-welcome boards or bear boards or something like that. But this bear decided he was going to get into it anyway and um, took care of. But we did get money back for it. So, all right, another thing. Oh. That looks like a pretty flower. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> we had one of these come up voluntarily in the compost bin. And this is, it, they're, they're native to this area. We've seen them in, Wal in Walsenburg, in the alley, by the way. Uh, this is called a datura, which is a moonflower. It is probably one of the most poisonous plants that exists. It's a whole plant. Root, yes. leaves, flower. It's also a very powerful hallucinogen in parts of it. Yes. If you don't know what you're doing, you will die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, they smell really good. Well, Thanks for the tip, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why you guys ate the Well, and I was going to say, and now you understand the grades. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so anyway, it, the, the point of this one is um, if you don't know what something is and it's growing, look it up, find somebody that knows, ask, um, something like that. So, um, yeah, anyway, nasty thing. But it smells really good. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the, the hose and gym part of that? Yeah. Okay. All right. People go by and they always ask, what do we grow? So we're going to quickly go by some of the things that we grow. We grow uh, broccoli, and we grow cauliflower, and we grow peppers of all kinds, not just these. These are um, poblanos, but we grow all kinds of peppers. And that's garlic and growing. We grow lots of that, and that's what it looks like and how big it is. Um, this area, hard neck garlic. Don't try to grow soft neck. Grow hard neck garlic. Hard neck garlic will store. We're able to store it for clear from one season to the next. And we're talking from the late August into the next July. Um, that's because it's hard neck. Soft neck won't. It'll start rotting or sprouting. Um, the garlic we grow is really, really nice. So get hard neck garlic if you're going to look for it. Okay? 
Um, zucchini of some kind. Plums. Green plums. Yeah, we were lucky enough to have that tree in our backyard. So, it was nice. <coughs> Cabbages. Um, you saw the one with Dye's face on it and stuff. Sunglasses. We grow cabbages, and behind that is, I don't know, there's some more cauliflower. Um, okay, we have zucchini and broccoli and green beans, and, and then people are going to ask, what do you do with it all? Okay, here's what we do with it all. What we have is... Um, Drive by? No, don't mention that. <laughs> Drive by leaving? No. We, we leave it on people's doorsteps. <laughs> no. uh, we, we have a root cellar that's um, probably seven, eight feet deep and concrete and lined with shelves. And um, so we uh, store a lot of things, root vegetables, and um, I've even put herbs in there before, and all of our garlic and, and alliums. Hard, hard squash. Yeah, the hard squashes, not the zucchini. Uh, but the, the uh, winter squashes, uh, acorn squash, spaghetti squash. Did you build the root cellar? Or no, it, it was there. It, we were lucky enough. It was there. Okay. Had it, had it been a Is what? water sister? Does what? Time, was it a water sister at one time? No, it was built as a greenhouse. Right. I have a, a pit, or a, as a, a root cellar. I have a picture of the building that's over it and then you, with the door. It's, it's like the old hurricane doors, you know, the old tornado doors. Um, okay, next one. We grow strawberries and fruits of all kinds. We do uh, currants, gooseberries, blackberries, raspberries, and strawberries um, for fruit. And then the fruit trees. And then we have apples and cherries. Cherries, peach, peach pear. pear. Well, tell me when your birthday comes. Um, apples will flower and set almost every year. Pears, not so much. Peaches are really rare to get a crop of peaches here. here. It's just, just yeah. way too high to do that. Um, About every seven years. Yeah, plums grow well here. Um, they do really well. Uh, but mostly it's the apples. Uh, behind our house, there's a huge field. That was an apple orchard at one time, way back. Um, but we have uh, the remnants of uh, a few trees left from that. Okay, fun fact. Strawberries. They're the only fruit that the seed is on the outside of the fruit, and the average strawberry has 200 seeds. Wow. I know. Look, <laughs> look what is growing in your gut. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You are a walking strawberry plant. You know? Who knew? Yeah. Potatoes? Hmm? Yeah, we do grow potatoes. Potatoes? Yeah. yeah. We grow potatoes in barrels. It's so just not... easier to control. Yeah, so you're not having to dig like uh, 12 feet around and look at yeah, yeah. You know, we, we kind of like limit how much we're going to go looking for stuff. Spaghetti squash, um, red onions, Cabernet is, is the, the variety. They grow really well here. The spaghetti squash, we learned this trick where we take two of our deep beds and extend a cattle panel across them like that so they grow up. We try to grow as much up as we can. The very first couple of years, we did things that were just sprawling all over the ground, and it just got out of control. We couldn't get into it to clean it out. We couldn't get into it to harvest it. We'd find all this rotted stuff after the season. So we grow up, and these things hang down really, really well. The heavier ones, like these spaghetti squash, um, we put mesh bags around and tie them so that it grows within the mesh bag and is tied up so the weight doesn't break the plant off as it grows. Um, so we dry herbs in the house. Oops, sorry. Um, my bad. No, that's okay. We dry herbs in the house. Um, this is some, what do we got here? Some lavender and some oregano and some parsley. Um, just bunches and bunches and bunches. And then we usually just uh, chop it up and, and throw it in a jar and it's dry. We do have a dehydrator. Is there a certain variety of lavender? Yes. <coughs> we, oh, I knew it was going to point to me. Um, okay, the three that I know will grow here are um, English lavender, Munstead lavender, and yes, Hypeco, yes. Um, I will caution you that box stores will generally carry a lavender called Spanish lavender, and it looks different. 
it looks almost like a little pineapple on top of it that turns purple. That, that is only an annual lavender. That w the lavender we plant comes back year after year after year. So um, uh, just be careful when you uh, purchase lavender. If you want it to be perennial, buy a perennial and, and stay away from like the box stores because they usually will not carry um, the, the perennial uh, lavenders. There you go. Okay, that's my spiel. Do, okay. Can I go home now? Do oh, you wait. mulch them? I haven't had them. Rock. Just rock. rock. Just the rock. Either pebbles or quarter inch rock or something. Just the rock. If, if, you, if you use like a, uh, a wood mulch around lavender, it could rot your um, plant, the, the crown of it. Yeah. So that, again, they're a plant that love rocky soil because think of the lavender fields in France and that is mostly volcanic rock. That's why both grapes and lavender grow well in those soils. It retains heat and um, retains moisture and, and does not rot the plant. We get so many lavender starts that have put themselves, they seed and they start up in the rocks. And so every spring we have to go through and pick them out and pick them out and pick them out. Usually throw them away, sometimes transplant them, um, you know, or invite people over to pick their own. Uh, because sometimes they get away from us and they'll, they'll get fairly big before we have to get them. So, okay. We would rather we home them. A few, have, yeah. have to put them to sleep. A few innovations we've run across and some luck along with it. This was something I, I heard about is a, a keyhole garden. And so we did a little variation on a keyhole garden. It's not as deep as some of them. Some of them, um, you know, maybe four feet by four feet by four feet. And we just took that just in a little shape. And that's tomatoes growing in it one year. It does really well. What happens is this little center thing, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a piece of quarter inch hardware cloth. And it goes all the way to the bottom. And you throw kitchen scraps in it. Mm -hmm. and compost, a little dirt once in a while, junk leaves from wherever you're planting and uh, not doing anything anymore. Keep it watered and then plant around the, the exterior of that and the brick itself retains the heat, especially in the early spring and then um, you mulch it as well but it, it feeds the plant and it, we have really good luck with that. Uh, so we've done flowers, we've done um, vegetables. vegetables mainly. Um, sunflower. Yeah, sunflowers did really yeah. well. They got about eight feet tall in that thing. Um, that was nice. Okay, fine. This thing right here on top of the. This is one of the best purchases you can you can make in La Vida. <laughs> it comes in four by eight sheets. Um, you can cut it with a saw, and you notice, this is what I did to shade up here at this altitude. It's so bright. We added that for shade. What I've done, the other thing I've done is I've laid like a bigger piece, a couple of them in an A-frame, tied together over the carrots. And it really, really helps. Things that are decimated by wind, this cuts the wind. The wind, the airflow can still go through, but it doesn't have that, that horrible, horrible um, direct, it blows things and breaks things. So this is one of the smartest things we ever stumbled across. We use this for all kinds of things. And like I said, it comes in four by eight sheets and you can just take a skill saw and, and run it. Now we're into my friend Hugo. Yes, <clears throat> almost. <laughs> we discovered that there is another African technique we were really looking for drought things, um, especially after the fires here uh, and the weather patterns changed here and things got dry and windy. So we thought, well, we got to do something. So this is a prepared bed. It's what it looks like right before we decide to put anything in it. So here's what you do. You dig a trench. It's about a foot deep. 
and anywhere from 10 to 12 inches wide. It's just a tent, a, a trench. And then you stuff it with old hay. Now the hay we use is probably six or seven years old, so it's not going to germinate anyway. The, the trench is too deep for that anyway. So you fill it with hay, tomp it down, wet it up really good, okay? Then you cover it up. Then you're going to take a soaker hose, and you're going to lay the soaker hose in its own little trench on the outside of the, of the trench that you did. Okay, next one. And you bury it. And then you've got an entrance that's just the end capped. And it goes all the way down there and all the way back. We use this not for root vegetables or anything. We used it for the brassica, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprouts, the cabbage. I've never had bigger cabbage in my life. It was huge without degrading any of the flavor. And the same thing with the broccoli and the cauliflower. The heads were huge. And I, because it had water at the root system all the time. And that hay acts as a sponge. And it's kind of a variant of the next thing we're going to try this year. And we have a couple of folks well, in here that are doing it too. Are yes? You, are you planting on the sides or in the hay? Um, uh, on the sides of the hay. Uh, on, the, on the sides. However, you can that you can put root vegetables on the sides and you can put like squash and stuff across the top. You can't have anything that's going to go down into that sponge layer because that would rot the seed. So as long because you've got like a six inch uh, margin of soil on top of all that hay and so by doing that you have enough for the root of, say, uh, zucchini to grow on, mm -hmm. and they, it can come over. But if you're planting on either side, now our beds are four feet wide. We've taken one foot out of the center of it, so you have uh, the margins on either side that are perfectly <coughs> accessible for planting um, all the other types of vegetables. Before we go on, the hay holds the moisture through capillary action out of the hay into the, the soil that's around it, especially if there's enough organic matter in the soil, not just straight topsoil dirt, but if it's well-built bed, then it will soak up to the edges of that four-foot bed once you water. And it takes, you know, an hour or two maybe to leave the soaker, the soaker on. on. And uh -huh. then, How often? And then you have three to do days. that maybe every three uh, days in the three, heat, four days. heat of the yeah. summer. But it'll, it'll last at least four days, wow. um, which is nice. Then you don't have to go out. Uh, I'm not a big one on using a, 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 a any kind of irrigation system. Mm -hmm. I like to look at my plants and, and touch them and see what's going on. So I usually hand water. But this was great. I mean, it, it, I still went out and looked at them and stuff. But watering from the bottom is, is really the way to go. So Well, be, because also watering from the bottom, you're not wetting your foliage, which is not going to um, damage it with sun, sun scald. Um, it's going to get underneath that last layer of uh, stuff you want to trim off anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, you, you want to, certainly around here, because we are water conscious, that we're looking for any method we can to still garden and be responsible with our water, with our water resources. Okay, so now we're, we're looking at Hugo. We're, we're looking at Hugo culture. Hugo culture. And Scandinavian thing. And you can, it starts here, below ground, hybrid, above ground. They bury logs in a pit, like dig a trench, bury logs, and then you'll have or an, organic, an organic mulch over the top of it. Actually, you throw dirt on. You, you have logs and twigs and stems and all kinds of stuff with some dirt thrown on it, and then organic matter, and then good topsoil and compost and a little more topsoil, mulch on top. 
we have seen Hugo culture that in a couple of months, all of these logs start to deteriorate and break down. But you can't see, they look, they look like they're whole, but they are sponges of water. They are just, you, you touch them and they, they, they do this. They, they hold the moisture so well. And this kind of extends the last thing that you saw where um, you have the hay in there through the capillary action um, uh, holding the water. This holds it even better. So, well, Maid, before you go, we only, for this area, recommend the below ground. The hybrid and the above ground would be decimated by both uh, the sun and yeah, the you wind. Watch that. Um, so, I honestly, I don't know how they do that. That looks dumb to me. Um, <laughs> but the below ground one, that makes a little more sense. Go to the next one. Do them in, in like rays. We're, we're going to talk. Yeah, about that. we're, we're going to get, get there. there. We're going to get there. <laughs> so this is the the formula in the concept. Okay. And this was from one of these companies, John. <laughs> yeah. 40% pilings of logs, 20% branches and sticks, plant waste on top, 10% compost, 5% topsoil. That is what we've seen. We're going to do that this year. So it's going to be our experiment. Okay. So leave it on us. John's going to do some. Ben's going to do some. And so uh, there are a few people around who are going to try it. So if um, you want to look at them or stop by, we're going to be doing some of this. We'll use the good soil that's in the beds already. And to fill one of these with straight planter mix, really expensive. Really, really expensive. Um, you'd have to get a dump truck here, and if, even if you could. <laughs> Don't buy bags, but, but you know, it can help it. But, so I'm going to use some, a lot of my uh, own garden soil that's there to fill them as we put them in. So um, I'm going to be curious to see how it works and um, if you're all curious, stop Deb, by. Deb. What kind of logs are you using? What Any, kind of trees? Anything but pine. <laughs> Why not Oops. pine? The pitch and the... Um, Bugs and the pitch. Yeah. And, and uh, so things like aspen will work well and we've got tons of that around here so um, and all you have to do is uh, ask Paul Branson for a permit and you can go up and he'll even tell you what area to go into to uh, uh, get your wood for free. Yeah. We've got trimmings from cherry trees and apple trees and uh, we've got a walnut tree and all kinds of stuff that we, we're using as well. Okay. Quest, two questions here. I, I don't know who Paul Branson is. I think he just answered that. Oh, okay. All right. Right. Over the Forest Service? Yeah. Forest Service. Yeah. Forest Service. Yeah. Down State Moore Forest. Road. But he's not here in town anymore. He's Paul is. In a different, well, he's in town, but he's working for a different part of Forest yeah. Service. So right. But then, the but then you can go to um, State Forest. Arthur. Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. Arthur. Yeah. Arthur's National and then... Mm -hmm. State the state, yeah. yeah. Will, clear yeah, in the back. Is that a frame like a cattle truck? Does it have a bottom? The, no, kind of, a kind of. It doesn't have a bottom. And the, uh, the reason I was drawn to it is because we have used uh, cattle troughs in the past. They get hot. This stuff has uh, a coating on it that prevents it from getting hot from transferring the heat into the soil. It's a reflective material that's sprayed on it, and it, it holds the heat away from it. So that's why we're looking at these in particular. There's several companies that have them. Um, we can share that with you, anybody later, uh, the names of those companies. What about um, bark? What? Did you use bark instead of wood? Okay. Uh, that's one of the layers. Yeah. So, so you want to put the log on the bottom, and then you would put uh, bark and twigs and leaves and stuff on the next layer yeah. up. And we have trimmings or you know clean out from the chicken yard and chicken. all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to mention inspiration and patience. Um, one of the devastating things around here was of course the fire and everybody knows about that. And the following year with uh, the water restrictions 
and how much we couldn't water and all that kind of stuff. So um, we needed a lot of patience. So when you need patience, you turn your waiting room into a classroom. So you go out and find things that, lovely things that you like, and whether they be somebody else's pictures, like this one, the lavender fields in France, okay, or something in your own backyard that gives you inspiration and just love on it. And so I'm, we have a few pictures in here of some of the nice things that we were able to do um, in the last 10 years. We have black iris. And uh, that was one of the good accomplishments. We have those poppies. If you get the right light in them, you get this wonderful effect. And so we had some nice, nice pictures. Um, a lot of these are pictures that are in our backyard, and you'll see a little bit of that. How we did that in just a minute. So honeysuckle and a rose bed and fountains, and you have to create your own oasis. And that was our. We wanted someplace beautiful. We didn't want to travel to someplace beautiful. We wanted to create someplace beautiful. And one, and go on to the next one. Patience. This is a wisteria in our backyard. Ten years it took to get this to bloom. <laughs> but it did. But it did. This finally. last year, it finally bloomed. Ten years later, it did that. Okay, next one. All right. Um, yeah, we take pictures of the chickens. Of, of the original chickens that we got, that you saw the first picture of, I still have one of my originals, and she's now nine. And, and so, uh, quick story, um, they, they can last a long time. There was a chicken in uh, Michigan who actually passed away on... Christmas Day, and she was 21 years old. So I'm just saying, you know, and you know, and then I go out to the chickens and I say, no pressure, you know, but just letting you know, you know, you got a bar to meet here. So and our nine-year-old is still laying. So um, and we also believe that the chickens deserve beauty too. So that's why I actually have planted around their coop. Um, this was last year's luck. Over here by the um, Methodist Church on Virginia, there was a small tree with some uh, old snow fence around it, and there was a bee swarm on it. And I got this phone call here at the library, here, here at, the, at the library from Adrian, and said, "There's a bee swarm." Okay, so I went over and looked, and sure enough, it was a bee swarm. So I took one of my empty hive boxes over there, and usually they'll hang in a tree, and you have to cut them and snap them and do all kinds of stuff. I just set that box right there, and they all just ladylike walked right in the box. That was great. I, you know, you rarely, rarely hear of that. And we still have that swarm, so it's, it's great. Okay, moving on to what you can do. This is the fun part. Set up what, what's your goal? What do you want to do? You have to be pretty intentional with what you want to do. You can't be really random and vague and start and stop. You have to be intentional. So vegetables, flowers, and fruit. That's what it boils down to. One, two, or three. Whatever you want to do. Pick something. And then decide what you have to work with. Time, resources, and location. How much time can you devote to this? When we put in all of those gardens, I suppose we put in, what, 30 hours a week, each of us? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it doesn't take that much time. Yeah, we're, we're down to maybe 15 a week, 15 hours a week, if that. Anyway, decide what time, if you're, if you're, if you're retired and you need something to do, fine, if you're still working, fine, do something. It doesn't have to be this, you know, as huge as this was. And what resources do you have, and um, what was the last one? Location. What do you have to deal with in your location? Are you dealing with bugs? Are you dealing with uh, grasshoppers? Barb, sorry. <laughs> if you're on the east side of town, you've got grasshoppers. If you're on the west side of town, you have flea beetles. So, it's a trade-off. Uh, any, anyway, uh, the wind, the sun, the, the 
water, the whatever you have access to. Think of that in your location. Yeah, be aware of what you've got. Yeah, because we'll, you need to know what your light is throughout a day. Yeah. As to what the light expectations of uh, what you're going to grow will we'll, you want to make sure that that's met. Again, oh, yeah. they just want to grow. seeds. Just want to grow. Yeah. You just gotta put put them in the right place. Overcoming challenges, yes. Wind. That's why I like this. This is great for wind because it's a great windbreak. Um, water. What are you gonna do to conserve water? Here's a little thing. You need to get yourself one. It's a moisture meter. Well, it's two other things. Well, too, yeah, it does pH and it also does light, but primarily we use this for uh, moisture to tell exactly at what depth it's, it's moist enough. Um, you can put it right on the edge, edge of the soil and you'll be dry and you can go down an inch and you'll be nice, two inches, and you're over, over water. So you really have to be able to use one of these effectively to overcome any kind of... Uh, Water problems, drought problems, uh, and mulch, 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 mulch. Okay, temperature extremes. We get, oh, I mean, we, we get such nasty temperature extremes here. Um, from the low 40s to it'll go over 80. Remember that <clears throat> nightshade plants like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants will not set fruit on the blossoms if it's under 50 degrees at night. You have to have the nighttime temperatures over 50. You also cannot plant them out, especially peppers. Peppers will stunt. This is a thermometer made for compost. Use it for soil as well, and it will give you an accurate reading of your soil temperature. So make sure your soil temperature is over 50 degrees before you put those nightshades in the ground. That may be the second week of June. So you really got to watch that, um, especially here. You know, we've had snow at, you know, how late? So, okay. Um, oh, insects. Insects are horrible. Um, <laughs> Barb is dealing with grasshoppers. She's on the east side of town. Grasshoppers... <laughs> Nasty, nasty, nasty. And they're supposed to run in, they don't follow the rules. They're supposed to run in cycles, they don't. Um, if you really want to try to get rid of them, if, if you can get guinea fowl or turkeys or something like that, ducks are good, they'll eat the grasshoppers. Uh, otherwise, there's this product called Nolo Bait, and it's, a, um, it's an organic thing, it's a spore. And the grasshoppers ingest that, it eats them from the inside out, then the other grasshoppers cannibalize them, then they get it, and it, but it's a little bit slow to work, and it's a hard product to find. If you're going to look for it, look for it now. And we can tell you later, one-on-one, -on -one, if you want to know where to get it. Okay? Flea beetles are horrible. They will really attack uh, all kinds of stuff, especially eggplant. I hate flea beetles and eggplant. Um, <laughs> Yellow sticky tape. You can buy it in rolls. Put it around stakes. Uh, you can also buy it in sheets. It will attract, yellow tends to attract sucking insects um, like aphids and uh, flea beetles and that sort of thing. Uh, so there are ways around some of those. So um, the internet's a wonderful, wonderful resource. Also, up here, we have these books in our library. Not just because I work here, but <laughs> because it's a nice resource to have. There's a couple of things on high altitude in Warfano County gardening and some other things on organic gardening. We only do organic stuff. We're not certified because we don't sell it. We don't care. We know we're organic. So we don't use any kind of pesticides or, or any kind of things like that. Diatomaceous earth is another wonderful thing for like aphids and little green caterpillars that attack the cabbage. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, that is like um, ground, ground, ground up uh, seashells. seashells, limestone from billions of years ago kind of thing. So it's, it, but it's really fine powder and you, you put it on your plants and stuff. The problem is you got to do it every time it rains. Um, you got to redo it, um, but you just you have to watch it. And we, we, buy, yeah. we buy uh, food grade. 
Yeah. Food grade diatomaceous earth. Food grade diatomaceous earth and big bags. What's yep. pools? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the vermin. Uh, yeah, vermin. We've talked about deers. Gophers. I hate to kill them, but gopher traps are great. They do work. Um, juicy fruit gum. Juicy fruit gum. <laughs> that's what a, uh, that's what will attract them into the. Uh, a gopher will be attracted by juicy fruit gum. <laughs> and if they eat it, it clogs them up and they die anyway. But I'd rather snap them quickly. Anyway. Um, rabbits. We, like I said, <laughs> yeah, I know. We have our first rabbit. It's yeah. We'll see what happens. We have foxes now. There. Moles. Oh, and we Moles. have foxes. Moles. 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 Yes. Chasers. Mole chasers. Oh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Those work well. Yeah. Terrible. And voles. And, uh, yeah. Voles are another. And gophers. Yeah. yeah. Anything underground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah if, you, if you want a real fun time, look up Rodenator <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube. Anyway, they put propane in the tunnels and blow it up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, listen to the yeah, guys right. going, oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. We, we got a game going on. Okay. Planning your garden, how do I start? The first thing is, what's your long-term goal? Okay. What are you looking to do? Grow food, food, whatever. Determine your focus for this year. Because I guarantee you, if when you have your success, you want to do a little bit more next year. And then a little bit more after that. That'll always help. So determine your focus for this year. <coughs> Plan a budget. <coughs> Nothing worse than going to a big box store and spending all this money on flowers and everything and because they put them out in May. March and you yeah, think you're yeah. going to have a hanging basket. Uh, yeah, it's not going to last. So they count on that. Anyway, watch your budget carefully with that. Uh, things to think about. <coughs> If you're going to plant trees, you have dwarf, semi-dwarf, and full-size. Know your physical limitations. That's the point of this. Know your physical limitations. Um, we're, we're getting of an age we don't want to have full-size fruit trees where you have to climb up on a ladder and erect scaffolding and uh, too many horror stories of people falling off ladders. And No, we don't want to do that. So we put in dwarf or semi-dwarf trees. Um, just know, know what your, your limitations are. Determinate versus indeterminate. This, this applies to tomatoes. There are two kinds of tomatoes out there, determinate and indeterminate. Indeterminate means it grows in vines and keeps growing and vining and keeps growing and vining until the frost kills it. Determinate means it goes to a certain point and it's bred so that it stops there. It sets all the fruit it's going to and when it's done, it's done. Okay? So cherry tomatoes are generally... They're generally determined. Mm -hmm. You get some of the other ones that are, they just keep vining and vining. And so we have gone to growing, not on just those little tomato cages. Don't, don't waste your money on a tomato cage. Unless you're going to stake up zucchini. Um, that's why they're called tomato cages. <laughs> they have big towers. That doesn't even work. We went to using um, metal fencing that we would put on T-posts. Kettle panel. Well, kind no, of. Uh, hog panel. Hog panel size. But um, we would put it up about six feet. And then raised, uh, we'd raise it off the ground 18 inches. As we planted it, as it grew, everything under 18 inches, all the leaves would be gone. We'd take them off. Okay? You have to do that carefully. You can't do it when they're little bitty. But as they grow, because you want air circulation around them. Okay? So the indeterminate varieties will grow up. Generally, they'll grow up and fall over the top. You can prune tomatoes, so go ahead and prune them, uh, that, that sort of thing. But be aware of the kinds of tomatoes you get. Don't expect um, a little cage to hold an indeterminate tomato. Okay, that's a, it's kind of a waste of time. How much to plant? That's always the question. How much am I going to eat? I wanted Patty? to mention to always take your suckers off. Of yes. your tomato plants. If a little leaf yep. comes up between there, just pitch it off because the energy will go into that yeah. leaf instead of into the fruit. Yeah. Ultimately, you want to prune to one stem if you can. If you've got the luxury of pruning to one main stem on a tomato, sometimes two. The suckers she's talking about are in the armpits. 
of the tomatoes. You'll see a little thing start to come out. It'll start to grow. That will become another major stalk. So you want to take those off. Maybe leave one and two, uh, so you have two going up, and then your tomatoes will form off of that. Um, yeah, because it can really overwhelm you with little bitty tomatoes. If you want bigger tomatoes, prune them down to one or two stems. Okay. Um, how much to plant? That you're just going to have to decide on the size of your family, how much you're going to eat, what you're going to eat. Um, every year I end up throwing away spaghetti squash because I overplanted it. Um, and, and I have a root cellar full of it, and we just don't eat it fast enough. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. How many people have overplanted zucchini? <laughs> okay. Yeah. When to plant individual items? Like I said, you've got to watch soil temperature, especially daylight hours. Um, a lot of things like we can get. I have a, a chart here coming up about when to plant peas and stuff like that outside. If you plant indoors, there's an entire chart you can build. I have got right now uh, onions, yellow, yellow and red onions, scallions, and leeks inside up already. They're about four or five inches tall now. So them this. And yeah, I know. We plant so them in gel. this. We plant them in one of these. Most of you have seen these, seen these, they're plastic, they're 72 cell. I like this kind because it's got a vented lid on the top, and the lid and the bottom are usually reusable almost forever. The cell trays, if you're careful when you take the plants out and you bleach them or sterilize them after you've done that, clean them really thoroughly, you can reuse them. So um, you have to be careful with that. I showed that these have yes. bent. Okay. The other thing is tomatoes will go into, here's a great tip on planting tomatoes. <laughs> Don't plant them in the cells. Plant them in a cup, like these plastic cups. And I like to use one on top of the other. There's holes in the top one. You put it about halfway up with your planting medium. Plant your seeds in that. This has got rocks like one inch rocks in the bottom to hold it off the thing. Water from the bottom. Even with the trays, water from the bottom. If you water from the top, you'll end up getting this nasty fungus stuff on the top and you'll get another thing called damping off and the, the, it, the little seedlings can rot and you don't want to do that. The fungus that grows on the top, if you do get fungus, cinnamon will take care of the fungus on the top. Just ground cinnamon. Ground cinnamon. Hmm. But I like to do this, and then I don't have to what's called up-pot tomatoes, because all those little hairs, the hairy part of the tomato that grows, they'll put new roots out. So when it gets up to the top of this, put a little more dirt in the bottom of that, or in, in that, and you'll stack the dirt up as the tomato grows. And it will just, you'll have a nice tomato here, instead of having to up-pot and put them in pots and make a mess. And, all that good stuff. For those of you that are at an altitude, um, these are miniature greenhouses. I know it looks a lot like a milk container, right? <laughs> you know? But if you cut the bottom off, you can use the bottom underneath uh, potted plants uh, for uh, water basins. Um, but this, if you put it over your uh, seedlings out in your garden, take the cap off. In the morning, put the cap back on at night because you want to keep the heat inside here. So, and these, the wind doesn't bother them because when you put them in the soil, you give them a little shove and they'll go down. Once we're into nice weather, you can just take them and trust me, I've got ropes of these hanging in one of my sheds. You still put a stake in there. I put a stake through the handle of Because you're afraid. <laughs> you're afraid. Being yeah. very afraid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, starting indoors um, versus outdoors. Well, like squash. You don't. Yeah, there are certain things that the root structure does not withstand transplanting. Right. Melons, uh, any of the curcubits, in melons, uh, cucumbers. Uh, uh, watermelon, pumpkins, uh, those kinds of things. Zucchini. Zucchini. They do not handle 
the root system Perfect. breaks so easily and they don't have a lot of little tiny roots on them. They do not transplant well. They're so easy to break and tender and they shock so easily. The things that do work well, most flowers will transplant. Uh, the nightshades, tomato, eggplant, peppers uh, transplant really well. Um, onions transplant well. Um, but just it's, it's those tender things that you have to really watch for. So we start everything indoors and um, um, that we can, as much as we can, uh, under grow lights. We have a picture of that here in, in a second here. Hardiness zones, uh, the hardiness zone has changed because of the cl uh, changing climate around here. Go ahead and, and hit the next one. Um, this is uh, the, the hardiness zone. Here, we'll get to the picture in just a minute. The length of the growing season, our frost free day here is May 18. In Lavita. This year. Now, maybe. <laughs> the hardiness maybe. zones are based yeah. on averages and you know what that means mm -hmm. okay we're not at we're above average here yeah and and all all the children are good looking yes um, so. <laughs> so the frost free date is may 18. the first frost date is september 22nd so the length of your growing season is around 175 days something in there so as you're looking at these lovely seed packets that you get or in your seed catalog something else that um, there's sometimes more information about the seed itself in the catalog than on the package itself so don't throw away the catalog know where the company is on the internet and they will give you germination what the soil temperature has to be to germinate uh, how long the growing season how much time it takes to grow there's usually a little chart on the back of these that says uh, ideal temperature 60 to 75 16 inches apart frost hardy no minimum full sun 8 to 12 hours this was uh, this happened to be a sunflower but uh, you can also look up on the farmers almanac website the length of day uh, that's something else that's easy to, uh, to figure out we are now 6 a I don't believe it. I don't believe it either. That is the new, that is the new, put out in 23, that's the new hardiness zone. And you can go on the government website and that's what it says. Don't believe it. <laughs> Do not believe it, not here. The last fro uh, frost may occur as late as April 21, the first <laughs> mid to late October. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah. You, well, you, see, the conflict is the previous so slide just said the frost free date is yeah. May 18, yeah. and they're saying, oh, yeah, it'll occur as late as April 21. Yeah, well, that's the you must go, what? The, the, uh, the next year? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, maybe we're that little purple dot. Be careful. Yes, you know? we could be. <laughs> we and, are a purple dot. And if you really drill in on this map, you'll see that. La Vida down here in town is different. is different than, say, where you are. You're actually in a different zone. Wow. It's, it's weird. It splits, uh, 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 splits just right up. Just like the hill, it's different. So, yeah, you've got to really be careful. So to start, uh, Patty? Yeah, um, I've never been able to figure it says it's supposed to be hardy in 36 days, like a rabbit. I've never gotten that. Not here. No, if you're in, not the, even in my house. Michigan or something like that. No, I know, it's it's tough. That's okay. ideal conditions. Okay. Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah. Starting seeds indoors, what do I need? Here's what you need. You need seeds. <laughs> a growing medium. Um, I use a potting mix uh, to start with. Uh, a, an actual seed starting mix. Jiffy. Soilless. Does not have soil in it. It's <coughs> usually peat moss, although uh, coconut core uh, yeah. yeah. is good. It's coconut yeah. musk uh, yeah. trimmings. Um, and it's got vermiculite and perlite and um, <coughs> maybe a little bit of nutrient. Beyond that, that's all I use to start seeds. Um, a little bit of water, again, water from the bottom. Light, you're going to need light and warmth. 
We'll get to light in a minute when you see a picture, but um, the warmth, they make seed starting mats. They're heated mats that can heat the soil. Usually ideal soil is between 65 and 75 to start seeds. I have big racks of my lights, and when I start my seeds, I'll put the seed tray on top of the fixture, which is warmer than underneath the fixture, until it comes up. When it comes up, they immediately go underneath the lights. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so selecting seeds or plants, catalogs, um, great, internet, great, uh, whatever you find. They come in these lovely little packets. Um, two kinds of seeds you can get. You can get pelleted, which means it's got a little fertilizer capsule around it, and just regular straight seed. Um, either, either one's good. I generally don't like pelleted seed um, because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't germinate as well. And they go plastic, so you can't store very Yeah, and they don't yes. store. Uh, seeds will store, by the way. We'll talk about that in a minute. And seed racks, something to put them on. Um, heirloom, non-GMO varieties, organic varieties, hybrids. Um, you can grow whatever you want, whatever looks good, and whatever tastes good. Seriously. Understand that if it's got a letter after it, like V1 or F1 or something like that, it's been, been bred to resist a certain kind of affliction, whether it's a fungus or um, uh, some kind of um, uh, soil-borne diseases that happen. It's resistant to that if it's got a little letter after it. Heirloom varieties are nice, but they're not always as hardy as they need to be. However, Heirloom varieties will generally, are generally pure, pure bread, and then you can save seed from them. You can't save seeds from hybrid and always expect to get the same exact plant. Okay, so if you want a, uh, and, and I'll give you an extreme in a minute, but if you want a certain tomato that's just great, and, uh, well, I can't, that's a bad one because tomatoes are self pollinating. Um, let's use the squashes. If you take a couple of varieties of squashes, even a couple of different kinds, like spaghetti squash and Hubbard squash. <coughs> Something volunteers the next year and you get this lovely squash plant and it puts out these squash things. There is a chance that, that they put out these fruit. There's a chance it's toxic. Really, especially with the squashes. You've really got to watch squashes. So because they pollinate from plant to plant so much that you can get cucurbits crossing, like a cucumber will cross with a zucchini in a weird place. Yeah, they just look weird. I didn't know they, they were poisonous. They're weird. They can, they can be. be. They can be toxic. What not not enough toxic? to kill you, but what? What makes them toxic? Just the, the Just breeding? the genetics yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, seed starting mix we talked about. Soil-free mixture, vermiculite, perlite, peat moss. Uh, that, without the soil, it avoids a thing called damping off, which is kind of a, a plant rot. Seed traders, we talked in, uh, new or clean, sterile, we talked about that. Water, water from the bottom, always, go ahead. If you can do, um, sometimes they need misting. No soft water, don't use soft water. If it's been... Oh, it's not, because that's got salt in it. Salt right? in it. Yeah, filtered is different. Okay. So I was just use, saying if you've got a soft water, fil soft yeah. water in your world, yeah, 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 it'll yeah. kill them. Yeah. Uh, uh, misting, sometimes they tend to dry out on top, so just a light mist. Depends on how big they are. This is something you'll have to get used to. Water from below. <clears throat> Cover with these greenhouse lids to hold the moisture in. Um, if you don't do that, the top will dry out, and the top is where the seeds are because you plant them like a quarter inch at a, most. A quarter of an inch on the little ones, half inch to an inch on the big ones. It it just depends. There's this formula for doing them twice the diameter of the seed, and uh, it's too complicated. Just poke a hole and put them in. <laughs> <laughs> they want to grow. Some, Use filtered water if possible. Yeah, Betty. Some of your flowers need a well and other things. Yeah. They need light to germinate. Yes. They need light instead of instead to cover. Yes. yes. Snap dragons especially. Okay. Yeah. If you're going to plant inside, use full spectrum fluorescent bulbs. Full spectrum lights. You don't use the kind you can get, you know, industrial, that kind of thing. They have a green end on them is what you want to look for. And they're full spectrum. 
you know, you'll see the full UV spectrum on them. It gives them all the stuff they need. Okay? Spacing and height. When we get plants up, I will put my lights right here, all the way down to the bottom, and then just adjust it as they grow. They need as much light as they can get, and you'll see I've got reflectors on mine. You'll see here in a minute, okay? You can build your own. Just get some rolling racks and a couple of fluorescent light fixtures from Home Depot, and Bob's your uncle. Bob's your uncle, you got it done. Or okay. Robert's your mother's brother. Yes. Um, if you start small, you can always use a windowsill. Start them in the dark unless they need light to germinate. And it will say on the packet if they need light to germinate, okay? Sometimes they do need light to germinate, okay? Um, if you grow things like pansies and stuff like that. The germination time is on, on your seed packet too. Yeah, it is, okay. And as soon as those things come up exposed to light, immediately when you see a sprout, we use 18 hours on a timer. They need a lot of light. That's what it looks like, our plant lights. You can see each one has a reflector on it, and it's a nice plastic tray. We've had this for, what, 30 years? Anyway, um, and one seems to do it for everything we do, because when it gets big enough, we turn them sideways on there, and we can get, you know, four seed trays along each row, and that's generally enough. Um, 72 cells. Yeah. Yeah, you better each. hope. Yeah. Oh, sure. Warmth. Um, we put these, like I said before, I put these on top of the light fixture itself, and then move them underneath after they uh, sprout. Keep it 62 to 75. You can get soil warming mats. Um, planting seeds, the depth, uh, watch the depth, it will tell you on these packets how deep to plant them. And light, uh, we talked about that, keep them moist simply by watering from the bottom. Here's a good little tip. Let the capillary action, when you fill these with your potting medium, put it in here, put in a couple of inches of water, and let it sit. Before you plant your seeds, let it sit. Even overnight, the capillary action will moisten all that soil in there, and then all you got to do is plant the seed. Rather than trying to water it from above or below or worrying about it, no, just do it that way. Um, label your trays. Yeah, and always <laughs> label your trays. Oh, plant trays with similar germination time. You don't want to have something that takes 10 days to germinate next to something that has three days to germinate. So try to keep them similar times in these things. Label your trays, There's, because, oh, I'm going to remember. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you will, I never can. <laughs> you will have slept in between and then go, what is that? <laughs> yeah, OK. It's kind of like Christmas. When you get your seedlings up, you need to feed them. They're in a soilless mixture, so you're going to need to feed them. When the first true leaves appear, now, when a plant comes up, it comes up with these two little, usually skinny, long leaves. That's not the true leaves. You let the real leaves come up, then you can feed your plants just a little bit. Um, planting up so they don't overgrow and outgrow and get root bound in these trays, you need to plant them up into something bigger. So even though I do tomatoes in here, I don't do peppers in these things. I start peppers in the trays. And then when they get to a certain, uh, maybe uh, two sets of true leaves, I will upplant them into the red ones and let them grow uh, more. So that's called planting up. Don't overplant. Um, there's nothing worse than crowding 15 tomatoes into an area that's made for five. Uh, notice how big they're going to be by the time you quit. Um, you need to know how big it's going to be. Don't be afraid to kill a few, you know. Sometimes you'll get two seeds in that hole. It's okay to go clip. It really is. I mean, it just kills me, but anyway. And patience. Lots and lots and lots of patience. Okay, using old seed. Seed will keep. Record the age of the seed and plant one seed for each year. So if new seed, you plant one seed in the hole. If it's a year old, plant two seeds. If it's two years old, plant three seeds. After that, Dispose of your seed. Just get new seed. Unless you're saving. That's a different issue. Here's your uh, planting schedule. By February 1, plant onions, leeks, celery. Inside. Now, inside. If you're going to plant inside. February 15. Now, this can go a couple weeks, either direction. It's okay. Usually February 1, 2, 15. February 15, 2, 
22. But eggplant, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. February 21, peppers, broccoli, cabbage, herbs mostly. March 1, tomato, marigolds, other flowers. Don't plant too soon because things will tend to get leggy, long and spindly and not be really healthy. So moving plants outdoors, watch the soil temperature. We've talked about that. Harden them off. You need to expose them to the right amount of daylight gradually. Take them out for an hour, take them back in. Next day, take them out for a couple hours, put them back in. Next day, three or four hours, put them back in. Or, in our case, we use our greenhouse, in and out of the greenhouse, to get used to the, the, uh, the air as well as the light and, uh, and moisture. Okay, that's called hardening off. Okay, <clears throat> this is just kind of a fun little thing at the, at the end here. In our backyard, when we moved in, there was nothing. We brought two Adirondack chairs from Castle Rock, put them up. Okay. Then we decided, well, we need to do something. So I built that little deck back there. Well, that was kind of fun. Di painted the propane tank up there. It's supposed to be the yellow sun. <laughs> I've got pictures of the beetles on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we thought, all right, for all the stuff we're going to do, we got some landscape paint and started just painting things and then standing up on the ladder and taking pictures of it to know what we were going to do. So what that led to was the start of um, a little place where we had a grill and a pergola over the top of it. Did you skip one? No. No. Anyway, that's what that turned into. Next, next slide. Back. That, that one. That turned into that pergola. and, and That's what the wisteria is on. And we planted the wisteria on it. <clears throat> that was one year we had those sunflowers. It was great. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, and then we just moved on and kept building beds and kept building beds and cottage gardens and all that stuff. Planted and a dog. Planted a dog. <laughs> <clears throat> and do we have one of the, uh, where the cellar entrance is? Yeah, the next one. Um, yeah, but I want, a, you know, putting a water feature, solar water feature in your garden, it will attract uh, <clears throat> birds and, um, you know, just the sound of it adds life to your garden. Birds will add life to your garden. So put bird feeders out. Stuff like that, uh, little things. I've long been a proponent of, if you don't like what you see, change the view. So you have the power to change the view of what you're looking at. If it doesn't please you, change it. No, back up. Really? Thank oh, you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that little doorway right there is to the root cellar. Mm. And it goes under it's that building. It goes underneath that building. Mm. And then we've got a vent that goes up clear through the building so that we don't get stale air and bad things growing down there. Um, but we do. We have that as a root cellar. I've got a thermometer in it. Um, the coldest it got, when we, when we were so cold <coughs> know, a few weeks ago, the coldest it got in the root cellar was 34, which was really nice. Um, so nothing spoiled. Um, we never had it freeze down there, uh, which is good. We have another one of those under our main house, and it stays at 62 because the uh, hot water tank is down there, and it's and that's good for canned goods and some dry storage. So the point is, you can do this. You can do it um, if you start with the goals. Start with start slow. Do all those lovely things. Uh, just a couple more things before we go away. When we started out, this was one of the biggest helps we could get. This is called a broad fork. Okay, this is all metal. You can get these wood, but they'll break. Um, anyway, this is all metal. The tines are metal, 18 inches on the tines. They cut soil, and what happens is those garden beds, you just stick your foot on it, go down, back it up and it breaks the subsoil under there. Um, the idea is to not disturb the top layers of soil and all the microorganisms that are growing in that so much. We will turn them later, but it's nice to break the subsoil into it so that the new stuff goes in and can come up. Um, and and uh, you end up getting better minerals up into the uh, topsoil at that point. So before 
This was before the pandemic. I think we talked about it here, Tony, about getting one of these to loan out. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And then we forgot all about it. We did. <laughs> I did. I, I did too. We should do that. We should. And now you've been rememberized. Yeah. yeah. We, remember, we should do that. Yeah. We because it's a resource you can use, you know, for a week or two at the beginning and then you don't need it until next year or until the fall. So it might be nice if we could do that kind of thing. The other thing I want to quick show is, um, you know, a lot, a lot of you have um, asked about um, creating an environment where you can uh, put a hoop on something. Well, you know, hoops can be expensive. I'm basically cheap. This is just regular um, irrigation hose. Don't hit me with it. <laughs> but you would. Um, you can get 12 inch, I, I have it wrapped up because it's really funky. Um, that rebar? Yep, sure is. 12 inch rebar. All you do is you... Pre-cut at Home Depot. 12 inch rebar. Put your hose over it. Put your hose this end over here. We can do, may not do that. Yeah. That, that type. Okay, so now you get the idea of the hoop, and then you just cover it with this cool stuff called Reme. And I'm about to show you what that looks like. Oh boy, I didn't really put that on there. Reme comes in big rolls and stuff. But what it is, is it's a water and light permeable fabric that you can put over that hoop and it will prevent your cabbage moths from getting to your um, brassicas and stuff. It will also allow the light and uh, if it were to rain, the rain, it, this is water permeable. So, um, you know, this is how you make a hoop, a hoop house. Mm -hmm. So. There you go. You put several of those in a row and cover it. Okay. So they have a thing on the, I've seen it, I haven't done it yet, but they call it a French chenille caterpillar top. And so they rig the thing over the top where you can actually pull up the sides during the day, yeah. pull them back down at night. Don't you can also away. do that with this. Yeah, but you use that. You use yeah. that with yeah. the straps on it. And then you right. can you pull them up at the night, do the dinner done. They look so simple and so easy to yeah. use. I saw a lady in Colorado Springs uses them. Yeah, it's fun polyester. Can, and, then and, you can yeah. do also, you can use the plastic in the winter with the same technique. Mm -hmm. And it's just helpful for the wind. Yeah. It doesn't let them start exactly. flapping around. Yeah, exactly. And it's called a French chenille caterpillar. Yeah. And it's on YouTube if cool. anybody wants to look at it. Yeah. Very nice. Do you get clips to put over those somewhere? No. That's what I thought. Oh, kind of yeah. That's what binder I thought. clips. Yeah. We just use yeah. binder clips. A thing that binder clips? You know, you know like, big old binder clips? You know? Like paper clips? Oh, it's like cheap. Binder? Right. Yeah. It's Amazon, though. They're, 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 yeah, they're, yeah. 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 We were cheap, so we went on the cheap. Dennis. Spell the uh, name of that uh, fabric, please. R E M A Y. There's also Thank you. something called Agrabon. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a question back there. Where do you recommend picking that up at? Um, I think we bought oh, this okay. online. Okay. And again, it's not expensive. Um, but it sh and it will last several seasons if you take care of it. It's like everything else. Um, eventually, it, it will wear out. It'll it'll get destroyed by the wind. What does it? So yeah. So again, you know, it goes back to if you see us outside, you know, stop, ask questions. You know, um, it's one of those, we're not the end all. We are constantly, constantly learning, getting new ideas and stuff. Um, after the fire, I was so dry and, and 
um, had no ideas and I started going to YouTube and I started hooking up with all different types of gardening concepts and just looking at them and saying, how can I put that in here? How I like the way that looks, <clears throat> how do I bring it into my yard? And so that, look at magazines. Fill your eyes with stuff that makes <coughs> you happy. It's your yard. Make it work for you. So, I, it sounds kind of goofy, but think of your yard. In our case, our yard is three quarters of our property. Our house is small. And so, I look at each area of the garden as a different room. Well, what do I want that room to do? Or, oh, look at what I can do here. Or, oh, Sam, I have a new idea. And he always says, sure, and it'll go away. <laughs> but, in all honesty, he's been very supportive when I'll say, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's what I think it'll take to do it. Can you make it happen? And then he'll go, okay. So. I'm going to stump this book. It's for the first time gardener. It's called Growing Vegetables by Jessica Sauer. Um, she has a YouTube channel called Roots and Refuge. This was one of our uh, inspirations when it was so bleak around here for so long. Quickly, talk to them about what we discovered on the plants during the fire in 2018. What happened in oh, our this garden? Was really, this was really weird. You know how it, it casts that smoke hole? Before it started, we had nice growth on the plants. Then after it was all over, no. smoke came in, smoke went away. We noticed that we had plant, stem, plant. Because of the light gone for that period of time. Yeah. It was the most bizarre thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, questions, any more questions? Whoa. Um, where did you get like bulk soil? Like when you guys were laying down all the beds, where did you get like that much? Well, if you're not using bags, I guess. Um, that was there. Oh. Okay. And then we built the soil up okay. by adding amendments to it and a lot of natural things, leaf mold and a lot of compost, compost and a lot of you know all kinds of stuff. We have some friends up uh, up up twelve that um, we get dump truck load of goat manure. Um, put that in there, I, just all kinds of stuff. So it's just looking around for it. Um, I would also use bagged compost, but it gets a little pricey. Yeah. So if you're looking at doing that big, it, get, it gets almost prohibitive. Yeah, so. that's the thing I've been looking, we're, we're up that way, so it's more like deserty. Mm -hmm. The soil is just not yeah. great. Yeah, <laughs> so raised beds, okay. or, or those, those container beds, yeah. and yeah. I'd really suggest that. Worms. Yeah. Okay. You can buy truckloads of mulch, good compost type soils from uh, Trinidad. Uh, SNR and Landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's that, or you can go and load up your truck with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to go to. One of the things I didn't mention that we use for chicken bedding and then we turn it into the garden afterwards is pine shavings. Yeah. And they're really cheap. Yeah, you can go and get a big bale of pine shavings at Big R and it's... Be sure you use composted manure. It's got yeah, to set use, out yeah. a while, yeah. a year or so, or it'll be too acidic. Or do you mulch unless it's goat. Yeah. Well, goat, goat, sheep. Yeah, goat, goat and sheep mama. are known as cold manures. Yeah. Yeah. So, or I mean rabbits. Yeah. Rabbits, 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 alpacas, llamas. Yeah. Right. Um, as far as the root cellar goes, is there any particular way that you recommend storing the vegetables? Um, we don't let them touch each other. Um, it gets really rude when they touch each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, you braid the... I braid onions and hang them. Um, occasionally, if I'm doing something, like I'll, I'll have cabbage that I'm not ready to process yet, I'll clean the roots off and hang it from the root stem itself so it's upside down, um, so that it doesn't just dry out through the root stem. I'll hang those upside down. Um, 
garlic we usually put in egg cartons. Yeah, egg cartons. Oh. Just to separate so they don't touch each other. They tend to rot when they touch each other. It's just it's not good. So potatoes and onions I've wrapped in newspaper <laughs> yeah. for yeah. yeah. Yep. We've they used um, uh, cupcake things for yeah. apples. Uh, little things like that. You store your apples in with your potatoes yep. and stuff? Same room, yeah. Same room, yes. and it doesn't fine. affect them, but so they don't sprout. What we've no. had, what we have now, is uh, styrofoam containers from old food deliveries. Mm -hmm. We put the potatoes in there, and that, that so helps they're not out gassing and, and they're not getting gassed either. So, come around, nothing. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if there, if you knew of varieties of grapes that would grow. Yes, um, we do. Oh, I suppose you want the answer. Um, <laughs> no, actually, uh, they're available in, uh, in the catalogs that you can get that will grow at this altitude. And in our backyard, back by the chickens, we have uh, grapes that were actually on the property. Um, so those those yeah. conquered grapes grow here. Yeah. But okay. if you want to make wine, those are not. Wine grapes, no. Yeah, no, those no. are. But they'll grow here, grapes, yeah. and then we planted another variety, but, and it seems to do okay. And there are there are wine grapes that yeah. will yeah, will grow some. in this area. So. Can you start them from seed? I had some come up, some conquers. Yeah. Will they? They'll be true. You just keep them growing. Just yeah, keep yeah. Them. I know. Yeah. Like lemons or anything else you can grow. There's a type of grape that a lot of people grow, grow here. It's about my property. My first moved here. They're called. Niagara's, and they they taste really really fabulous. Yeah. Grow well. And I've seen several of them around town. So yes, yeah, nice. Niagara. Nice. With your bottom watering, are you taking your your plant cells and putting them into a container that's holding the water and letting them soak up, and then moving them back out? The same concept of the tray. If even with the up potted. Uh, plants, keep them in a tray. I'll put the plant in here. And then, and then you can, so you can put... With the whole yeah. holes in the bottom. Right. The only thing, this is just for tomatoes. This right. Specifically. But for other things, I will plant them in here and then just put them in water from the bottom and it'll just grow up. And I'll just leave it in there. I'm not going to fill this to the top. So you're just measuring how much you're putting in there so you're not overwatering, so That's it's right. not, not wet all the time. Obviously, right. you don't fill it all the way up. And right. If you are, you got too much, and you got to pour it back out. Exactly. Right. exactly. So you just want to measure to where you've got about... How much do you pour in when you're watering? About an inch or so, you said? When I do this, when mm -hmm. I put the cell in there? Yes. About the halfway mark, Okay. which is about an inch. And you're doing that like once a day or however? And I don't do that once a day. Oh, really? Oh, no, 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 maybe once every 10 days. Every 10 days? Yeah. Uh, you just keep, you don't need to. You okay. keep an eye on the top of your soil. If it's still damp or is slightly spongy, don't do it. Then don't then you don't really? need to water. So you're it, watering a lot less doing yeah. that bottom watering yes. than yes. you are. Yes. Yes. From the bottom always encourages the roots to grow. Right. Um, damp. Strong, yes. And, and, and remember that as the plant grows, it grows more foliage and there's more transpiration. Okay. So you're going to need more water then. Yeah, I'm definitely. But not at the beginning. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Um, how long does chicken manure have to sit in a pile before you? Uh, I is usually wait uh, like a full year for it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm I'm owning up to this. I'm lazy, and I go, oh, that's a lot, and I put it right in the flower bed that's right there. And it hasn't seemed to bother the trumpet vine or any of the seeds that I start, but I always work it into the soil, into the bed. Um, but <coughs> now, if it's veg, I put it in the compost. In it goes into our compost, compost, compost bin. bin. Yeah. Okay. On that matter, real quick, would you use fresh manure and root crops like the sheep manure? Uh, oh. Um, not she, fresh. Well, she, well, How long she, would you have to the, wait before you're okay with using it on root vegetables? The the cold manure. Yes. You you could use it, but what I would rather recommend is instead of putting the manure on new plants like that, make a tea out of it. Okay. Take take a a knee high nylon. Okay, guys. You may not realize this, but you can take a knee high nylon. 
fill it with the manure, knot it, tie it, and, and put it into a five gallon bucket. And you'll see the water color. Once the water is colored, <laughs> you can start using that on newer plants. It's a, it's a, but you, you know, can, you can use rabbit, alpaca, yeah. sheep, yep. goat. They'll go immediately. On, yeah. on even root crops. Is yeah. there any yeah. concern with E. coli or anything like that then with it? Uh, okay. No. No, it's usually. I wouldn't human. plant it in straight. Manure. Right, sure. It's got to be <laughs> right, amended. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, but. What kind of fertilizer do you use on your starts? Um, after they've. Um, you mean at the very, very, very when beginning? When they're just starting, yeah, you said to start fertilizing them when they get them there. <coughs> the true leaves. There, there's um, a, a company in Michigan that's um, called M M M.I. Gardner. And he makes a product called Trifecta. And we use Trifecta on all of our stuff. Okay. Happy Frax. I'm a Michigander, and I know it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. We use, we use so you, you know Luke Miriam, probably his mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the thing about Happy Frog, and I use it sometimes, it has different NP. The NPK. NPK. Yeah. yeah. NPK. NPK. And you have to kind of watch that because you don't want to put high nitrogen sure. on your tomatoes or you're only going to get leaves. Leaves. Yes. Correct. Yes. And you need uh, P for your root crop. Sure. Yeah. There's, three, there's like three different kinds of happy frag. You can get one for growth, one for bloom, one for... Right. You, know, you right. just have to be sure you've got the right... Combination. Yeah, so like root crops, you use a high nitrogen or a high uh, phosphorus and potassium content. We we uh, also throw the uh, ashes from our wood fireplace out there, but never do it with potatoes or where you're going to put potatoes. The other thing is if you have walnut tree, never ever ever use walnut leaves or anything in where you're going to put tomatoes because it'll kill them. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of these little things, the tiny, tiny little details that you learn. Oh, except for, or oh, except for this. Um, it's kind of like the English language. It just comes <laughs> with experience, and that's, yeah. It's so, always this until you do this. If you okay. have a question, stop by and ask us. I thought the wood ashes were too, is it basic? So we have very alkaline soil. We have alkaline in, soils. In Colorado, so you don't normally need wood ash because yeah. that is alkaline. You, you have to know what you're going to plant next year, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and if you know you're going to have something, if you know you're going to plant beets, you want something that's going to be high in potassium and phosphorus. So you can add wood ashes to that. You know, a little bone meal to that. You know, you, you have to be plant specific and know ahead of time where you're going to be and what you're going to be okay. planting in that area. And uh, fertilize plant specific. Question way in the back. Did you, did you plant your apple trees, or did they come with your crop? They came with the They property. came with. We, we planted pear, peach, plum, cherry. Yeah. The apple trees were left over from that great big apple orchard. I mean, they're old apple trees. How, how did you ask that? Do I have another question about uh -huh. that? The property we bought came with an apple tree in our front yard, where we have a chain-link fence. And as soon as the apples are starting to develop, they're cleared off before they can even get big. By deer. Deer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're they're nasty. I believe they're a green apple. You know, we have tried so many different deer repellents. Everything from red Christmas lights hanging in the trees because they mimic predator eyes to automatic sprinklers. You know. And what else have we done? They get pissed all of it. Send the dogs out after them. And paintball gun. <laughs> paintball gun. Paintball guns were fun. But the paintball guns wear out. Uh, they, they get cheekier and cheekier every year, especially at running time. In the fall, you know, oh, they're, yeah. But we get bear, too, because we're close to the river. And the bear get up in the apple trees. And, or they'll send their cubs up in the apple trees. And We've, wa we've watched the cubs huck apples out of the tree to mama in the field next to us. So I thought, nice. Your cherry, what kind of cherry? Is it a sour it's cherry? Yes, sour cherry. Sour cherry. And, and Jay, do you get fruit every year here? Not every year. Uh, about every other year. Yeah. Or three, you know, two out of three. It actually works, it's pretty well. I have to burn now. 
Yes. Because the, the robins yeah. and grackles will just yeah. go nuts. Strip them. So. Yeah. Do you develop your own potato seeds? Yes. What? Do you sand them? No. How I just you? all I do is just save them from year to year. And in your root cellar. In yep. the root cellar. And you, you don't. You don't. Uh, sulfur them or anything. I don't use sulfur. I don't. I just and we get how do you, nice. How do you do? How do you determine which ones to see? Um, usually looking for the number of eye dots, potential eye dots on them. Do you have generational issues with them? With no, no, we haven't so far. But we haven't been doing it that long, so. And we do Yukon Gold, we do... Um, the, the, yeah, the, the Long Keeper, our Kennebec, we use, and Yukon Golds, and we've had really good luck with purple. <laughs> purple yeah. potatoes. They're purple, purple skin, potatoes. purple flesh potatoes, um, which it's just you put them in boiling water and they dissolve. Their, the starch content is really weird. Um, but what else What else have we got? Oh, the red potatoes. And you're doing them in barrels, right? Yeah. Do we do them in barrels. Yeah, whiskey barrels. Just because I'm basically lazy and don't want to have to go, you know, hunting Easter eggs. You know? We did them in the ground <laughs> once and, and it just, yeah. Yeah. They were all over the place. They just ended up so, all over the place. Yeah. Do you know of the good arborist? Yes, please. <laughs> she has a boat for one. No, she's looking for an arbor. Never mind. Um, for her no, little no. arbor? <laughs> no, we don't. I've asked around people from Pueblo, people from Trinidad, they never show up, they never call back, they never. Yeah, yeah I don't know. There is a gentleman in the arbor that, that trims trees. And he trimmed one at our church, and he did a pretty good job. So you know the guy in Fort Garland that we used, he's a firefighter, so he's really used to being up high in precarious situations. Do you have his name? They have a list of them at Yeah, they do. Yeah, because you have to have a license. Sure, you do, yeah. I climb up in my own tree. Yeah, that's why they're semi-dwarf. Okay. Well, Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Now go plant. But not too soon. Go plant. You can start your seeds indoors.